911, what is your emergency? Christmas Cross Sheriff's Office. Yeah. Got an open line here with no sound at all. You could hear um, the operator talking to what was an open end. There was nobody there. But there is someone on the lawn. It's Stephen and Michelle's two-year-old son. I'm, I'm sure maybe the parents are still sleeping. Officers are immediately dispatched to the Andrews home for a wellness check. An officer responded and found a small child wandering around and had what appeared to be blood all over its outfit. The child is removed from the scene and taken to a safe place. I get a knock at the door, and uh, Tracy, uh, sheriff's deputy, was standing on the other side of the door. She lived in the community. She was in full uniform, and she's crying. And she says, Sean, I need you to watch Stephen and Michelle's son. And I said, sure. Um, she says, we'll have uh, more deputies in just a few minutes. I said, what's going on? And she turned and she walked a few steps away and she stopped and she turned back and she looked at me for a minute and she said, it's the most horrific thing I've ever seen in my life. It's 2005, and just two days after Christmas, the spirit of the season has been snuffed out by the murders of Fort Myers residents Stephen and Michelle Andrews. I just remember there being such a sense of shock when it came out, their ages, that they were a young couple with a young child. We did interview as many people as we could. A lot of the neighbors didn't want to talk. I think that they were afraid, and they didn't really know what was going on. Stephen and Michelle, we're talking just extraordinary people. They're super sweet, always very kind, very cordial. What in the world could have perpetuated this? Up in the Andrews' master bedroom, investigators continue to try and piece together what may have happened. All the scenarios start running through your head. When you have two deceased persons, husband and wife, one of the first things that runs through your mind is possible domestic violence. This was a horrible crime scene one you couldn't even imagine. And from the looks of it, Michelle fought for her life. The uh, medical legal death investigator examined the female victim and took photographs. Michelle's body was positioned in a grotesque manner that might allude to a sexual crime. What came to mind when I first saw the photograph was Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man with the arms out to the side and the legs spread apart. She did not die naturally like that. This was a message of some kind. Typically with cases like this, we do get a lot of phone call leads. Some are good, some are completely abstract and have nothing to do with it. But if there's a lead comes in by phone and there seems to be some kind of validity to it, and even if the, off the top of your head you don't think there's a validity to it, you still want to follow up on it. One particular tip that grabs the attention of investigators pertains to an exchange in early December at Stephen's company holiday party. Stephen Michelle went to his company's Christmas party. While there, gifts were exchanged but when the office secretary, Kelly Ballou, presented her gift to Stephen, it took Michelle by surprise. Steve had just recently purchased a new Mercury Marauder. Kelly bought him a very expensive key ring for this car. It was a gift that Michelle did not think was appropriate for a coworker to give her husband. In uh, this case, both deceased ones, they had been transported to the morgue. The medical examiner gave us permission to use the cyanacrylate method 
to see if we can detect fingerprints on the human skin. This is a method which is used to uh, detect if there is an imprint from a person touching the deceased and leaving a, a rich detail, in other words, a fingerprint. We have the bodies on the gurney, and we take the cotton balls, and if you put a little bit of baking soda on it and put a regular super glue on it and cover it up, it will fume. And then the fumes will harden the surface, and then if you take a glass, let it sit there for a couple of minutes, when you take it out, you're going to have white imprints off the fingerprints on the glass bottle. And then you put the black powder on it, and that's how you develop fingerprints with the cyanacrylate method. We had applied it to both of the victim's arms, legs, and uh, stomach area, and we did not find any kind of fingerprints that were identifiable. I thought the prosecutors in this case did a great job of uh, laying out the facts for the jury. And part of that was establishing that Fred Cooper had been in the Gateway community. Fred, his mother, and Kelly, and a young child lived in Bonita Springs, about 30 miles apart from the Gateway community. So there was a lot of testimony about the distance that it would have taken him to get from on his motorcycle from one point to the other point. that they called a, a witness, a woman who worked in a sales center, I believe. And she, her testimony was that Fred had come in and asked for a code uh, to get in, claiming that he was renting and needed the code to get in. So I thought all along the prosecutors did a great job of establishing, look, he had a way to get in because he got this code. These neighbors saw him with the camouflage jacket. The affair came out. So I thought they did a, a nice job at both trials of kind of outlining and, and getting him, Fred, inside of the community. As a reporter on TV, our, our job is to be a visual medium and to provide people with pictures. And I remember when Kelly Ballou's name surfaced, we couldn't find any pictures of her. And so she was kind of a, a mystery figure for a long time. And I remember at the trial um, was the first time that a lot of people saw her because she was very somehow just this quiet figure of this story, but yet was very much a part of the story. Kelly testified that they did meet up the night before the bodies were found, and then that was an important part of the trial because they were trying to establish a timeline of where Fred was and when he wasn't home and when he called her. She was very soft-spoken, well-spoken, but soft-spoken, and she didn't show any emotion. And I remember thinking that, not, not good or bad, but just thinking, here's someone who you have a child with, you've been in a long-term relationship with, and you're not showing any emotion one way or the other. I remember feeling the sense she didn't really want to be there.